Uh, tonight, I'm sure you've all heard, but just to recap really quick, uh, the party is actually going to be in this room at 9 o'clock. Uh, all the beer is uh, free until midnight, and then there's uh, cash only uh, from midnight until 1, and it shuts down at 1. Uh, the entrance is going to be uh, through the back door from the terrace level. And uh, you also get a ticket when you come in for a free mixed drink. Uh, also, our lost and found is uh, growing. Oh, one more thing about the party. You actually need your badge at all times. Uh, and if you want to stay in the party, you'll have to remain wearing your badge. Um, and about lost and found, our lost and found is growing. So if you've lost any items, uh, please head over to registration and uh, retrieve those items. Uh, now I'd like to uh, <coughs> now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next talk. It's uh, we got some gentlemen from the EFF here to answer your questions, and it's going to be an open forum where they what we'll have you do is we'll just hand you a mic if you want to come up here and ask your question on mic, and then they'll go ahead and uh, answer your questions. And to do that, we have uh, Kurt uh, Opsal and uh, Nate uh, Cardozo. All right, take it up. Can we get the mics turned on? Maybe? Nope. Where's Bob? All right, one moment, please. We can also, if you want to get started with this mic up here, we can do that. All right, well, while we're working I'll, I'll on that uh, technical uh, difficulties, I'll come to the working mic. Oh, that does sound much uh, louder. So, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kurt Opstall. I'm the Deputy General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier uh, Foundation. I'm here with my colleague, Nate Cardozo. Uh, together, we work on, uh, amongst other things, the Coder's Rights Project at uh, EFF, which is uh, a, uh, well, let me start out and say, how many of you are uh, familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation? All right, so I can keep the description pretty pretty uh, brief. I think you guys know about generally what we do. Uh, we try and fight for your rights online. Uh, and one of the ways in which we, we do that is the Coder's Rights Project, which is where we try to provide help to uh, uh, security researchers, people who have discovered a vulnerability and want to discuss about it or are concerned about the legal implications of either their research or, or the disclosure of the vulnerability. Um, and so uh, we love to talk to those people and, and answer questions, but this is not the forum uh -huh. for doing that. So if you have uh, something that uh, you want to confidentially talk to us about, uh, you, can, you can seek us out after or send an email to info at EFF.org and we'll try and set up a time to talk. But in that this is a, uh, a public forum, this is where you can ask all sorts of questions, but try not to ask the ones that are about your particular legal situation where it should be done uh, confidentially. Uh, so with that, uh, 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 we're going to hit a couple of issues. Uh, so as I said, uh, we're lawyers and, and we do uh, some aspects of the work, but uh, EFF actually has many different uh, people working uh, to, to help you out. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to the lawyers, there are um, technologists who do software projects. We have activists who try and uh, push for political change through petitions, through contacting legislatures. So we're going to touch on a couple of those uh, those projects, and we can do our best to answer questions about them. But uh, uh, mostly, we're on the on the legal side of the fence. Um, so I guess uh, with with that uh, brief introduction, we'll start to talk about some of the uh, legislative issues that uh, could be of interest. And so, Nate, you want to start with ECPA? Sure. So one of the things that uh, is in my bailiwick at EFF is proposals in Congress right now to reform the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which we call ECPA because lawyers love acronyms. Um, ECPA was passed in 1986 when you know, Gmail was not even a glimmer in Larry and Sergey's eye. Uh, webmail didn't exist. Uh, it was a strict client-server model back then, essentially, you know, with, with, with exceptions. Um, and so ECPA doesn't get the way that people use email. And right now the law says, makes a distinction between opened email and unopened email, makes a distinction between email older than 180 days, 
uh, because hypothetically, you know, back in the day, if there was email still left on the server after 180 days, that meant it was abandoned. Now, of course, those distinctions don't make any sense whatsoever. So we're working with uh, Senator Leahy pr primarily, as well as uh, Representative Polis, to update the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to make sure that law enforcement always gets a warrant uh, before it can uh, open your email. Um, the, the major opponent in this fight, surprisingly, is not the Department of Justice. It's the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, which is, was surprising to, to me and was surprising to most of my colleagues. So ECPA reform is going to be a, a, a big push of ours in the 114th Congress. Um, I, I never, I didn't go to law school to do legislative work and I never thought I would do it, uh, but I kind of like it and, and you know, we, we, might, we might win on this one, fingers crossed. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and there's another, uh, well, it's not quite a bill yet, but another uh, legislative issue that uh, I think uh, you guys should know about. Um, as, as some of you may have seen er, earlier this week, a couple days ago, the Obama administration came forward with uh, their recommended uh, amendments to uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. That is the primary federal anti-hacking statute. This was part of a uh, broader uh, cybersecurity bill. Uh, and they, uh, they, they sent it along to Congress saying, could you please put, put out a bill that accomplished these things? They sent it with a cover note saying that uh, the Sony uh, hack uh, uh, showed why this was, uh, was necessary, though oddly enough, nothing in their amendments would have changed anything with respect to the Sony hack. But it was in the news, and, the, and they feel like they have an opportunity. The, uh, the proposal itself is e extraordinarily similar to one that they made in, uh, in 2011. Uh, so, uh, and and that, that was not the first time either. So these are some uh, aspects of the Department of Justice's uh, wish list that uh, they, they felt like now would be a, a good opportunity to uh, push forward on. And uh, this, this wish list has uh, a number of uh, disturbing things. It, it is um, taking a, a bill which is actually kind of problematic as it is, uh, and in many ways uh, making it making it worse. And I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of the uh, features of the proposal uh, that we're going to be uh, opposed to. Um, one aspect of it is uh, they, they talk about unauthorized access and then exceeding your uh, authorization and. The, the uh, current language is just says you know, exceeds uh, authorization. There's been some question about what that means. The Department of Justice has taken the position in some litigation that if you violate the terms of use of a, of a site, you are exceeding your authorization because you're no longer authorized to use the site. Uh, and uh, they, they've brought some, some cases along that line saying that that is, is hacking. This leads to some ludicrous uh, circumstances. Uh, for a while, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, were looking at some various terms of service. We saw that Seventeen Magazine uh, had a provision in their terms of service saying that uh, uh, you had to be 18 or older to use their website so that anybody who, who was 17, who went to Seventeen Magazine would be in the DOJ's uh, arguments, if, they, if, if those were adopted, committing a hacking crime. And this is, you know, somewhat, somewhat ludicrous. Uh, but there was some good news uh, uh, that uh, some courts had interpreted the exceeds uh, uh, authorization to exclude terms of service to say that um, you know it had to be uh, a, a technical uh, protection and less of a uh, terms of, of service thing. So the DRG uh, didn't like that so much, and they have proposed in the new bill. Um, and let me actually just get the uh, the language uh, that exceeds uh, authorized access. Now, two, one second. Um, that well, basically, that that the exceeds authorized access is if you should have known, had reason to know that it was a bad thing. Um, for the purpose that the accessor knows is not authorized by the computer owner. Um, and so this is, this is somewhat uh, uh, broader uh, even than uh, the, the terms of service because it also uh, is an attempt by the DOJ to encompass circumstances in which even though there is no written prohibition against doing it, they feel like they can convince a jury that you should have known 
not to, not to do that. And what we'd like to see instead on this is that it be technical protection measures, that uh, if you ask a, a computer server for, for something and it tells you no, then that's a technical protection. But if you ask and that provides you the information, then that is the act of authorizing it. So if you go to a website, type in a URL, and it, it comes back with a response, there'd be no way to say that that was unauthorized. Uh, this is a reference to a, uh, a case which they brought against uh, uh, Andrew Orenheimer, who had iterated some numbers in a URL, and they believed that that was a form of hacking and, and prosecuted him for it. Um, another concerning feature about the, the new CFAA proposal uh, is uh, they have a provision right now that is about sharing passwords. Uh, and if you, if you share a password with an intent to defraud, uh, then that is a violation of it, and it starts out with a misdemeanor, uh, and then on your first offense, and if you do it, you know, uh, subsequently it can it rise to a felony. Um, and so what they want to change that to is they're removing the intent to uh, defraud, uh, changing it to a 10-year felony, and adding in addition to uh, passwords, this term, an undefined term called means of access. So that if you are uh, distributing a means of access, this is a, a potential 10-year uh, uh, felony. And then they, they limit it a little bit uh, with some language which is not very uh, uh, comforting. Um, and I'll get that exact language as well. And uh, unless you have sort of knowing or having reason to know that a protected computer would be accessed uh, or damaged. And so this, this has raised uh, a lot of people's uh, concerns that uh, it broadly defined if, if, a, if a court or the DOJ decided to uh, look at means of access in a very uh, broad sense, they could say that uh, proofs of concept, pen testing tools, exploits would all be a form of means of access. Uh, and uh, if you were putting it out in an environment where there might be somebody who would misuse it, um, you don't want to be having to uh, defend a case uh, on whether you did or didn't have a reason to know that, that some bad person was in the audience. Now, I mean, the DOJ will tell you that uh, through prosecutorial um, discretion that uh, uh, they would not uh, do that but we have not seen enough to give us confidence that they would. So anyway, that, that is just a few of the things with uh, CFAA. It is a, uh, a big problem. We'll be fighting against it. Um, and one sort of sound bite you can take home from that is, under the administration's new proposal, sharing your HBO Go password with your friend is now a 10-year felony. Um, we think that's ridiculous. Uh, one of the cases that I'm working on um, is a FOIA lawsuit, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that EFF filed. Uh, we sent a Freedom of Information Act request to uh, both the NSA and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI, uh, seeking information about the so-called vulnerabilities uh, equities process. This is the Obama administration's new term for when they sit on ODAs. Uh, they, they, they say that they sometimes do, uh, and that they have this process to decide whether and when to do it. And they've called it the vulnerabilities equities process. We don't know anything about it, so we filed a, uh, a FOIA request. Um, they, of course, ignored the FOIA request, as they do. Um, so we sued over it. We've gotten a little bit back. Most of it is too redacted to, to see anything. Um, but expect more documents in 2015 on that, so that, that should be fun. Uh, so another uh, piece of uh, litigation that we've been working on uh, was uh, our uh, challenge to the national security letter power. This is a power that the statute has granted to the FBI where they can go to a service provider and hand them a letter. Uh, the service provider is then supposed to uh, identify uh, the uh, account information about one of its uh, users and to never speak of the letter again. Uh, and the, the FBI has, has issued hundreds of thousands of these letters. Uh, there have actually been, I believe, six challenges to it. So uh, uh, there's not very much incentive for a service provider to, to bring forward that challenge. Uh, we believe these are unconstitutional, uh, both 
because of the perpetual gag order that uh, doesn't allow the service provider to issue a true and, and uh, honest uh, transparency report and say how many national security letters that they've received. And substantively, because it is requiring uh, information to be given up about somebody without any court involvement, without uh, the judiciary uh, saying that this is, this is okay and that uh, it's not going to infringe on somebody's right to speak anonymously. Uh, so we brought this challenge a couple of years back, uh, representing two service providers. Uh, we cannot name them because of the gag order. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, we were able to uh, uh, get the court to agree that it was unconstitutional. So the uh, federal district court out in San Francisco found that national security power was unconstitutional. It stayed its decision uh, pending appeal. So we just had the appeal in October, uh, I argued, uh, before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal that uh, they should uphold the uh, district court's decision, and now we're awaiting the result on that. Um, the Ninth Circuit's average time to decision is six months, right? Six months after argument. So April would be average, and we have no idea when it's coming down. Uh, the other cases that you guys are probably pretty interested in here are the cases where EFF is suing the NSA uh, for their various warrantless uh, wiretapping and other mass surveillance programs. Uh, the, the oldest and sort of most high profile and most, one of the most important from our perspective is a case called Juul. This is a class action that we brought on behalf of AT&T customers um, after a whistleblower named Mark Klein walked into our office with diagrams of the secret room at the AT&T facility in San Francisco where they have a fiber optic splitter that everything going across the AT&T network uh, is copied and that copy goes to the NSA. Uh, the Jewel case was filed uh, back in 2008 mm -hmm. uh, and is still ticking away. We've been up to the Ninth Circuit and back uh, on that case. Uh, our current judge is a very thoughtful man uh, and takes forever to rule on, on anything. Uh, the most recent hearing there was on uh, cross motions for summary judgment, very technical proceeding, but could have significant impact, and that was in December. We have no idea when he's going to rule on those cases. Um, the other case uh, that is in front of Judge White is First Unitarian Church uh, at all versus NSA. This is a case where we, we represent uh, 25 different membership organizations challenging the telephone metadata collection program, the, the 215 program, also called the BR FISA program. We, rep we represent uh, a couple of churches, uh, including the name plaintiff, the First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles, uh, the Council for American uh, Islamic Relations, a Jewish uh, radical peace group, Human Rights Watch, Greenpeace, uh, a medical marijuana group, a Second Amendment gun rights group, um, and like some 20, student yeah. groups, yay, gun rights, uh, okay. suing to, to get the 215 metadata collection program ruled unconstitutional because by definition, what they're trying to do is figure out Americans' associations in that, in that uh, program. Um, uh, we also are co-counsel with ACLU, uh, representing a lovely man out of Idaho named uh, Peter Smith uh, and his wife, Mrs. Smith, I don't know her name, um, who are suing the, uh, the NSA over the same program. Um, he, he represented himself uh, in Idaho District Court um, and did, did a great job, but, but lost there and asked for our help uh, at the Ninth Circuit level. That case was argued uh, in the fall December as well. December 8th. December 8th. Uh, and so that, that case was actually argued on, on expedited briefing schedules, so we may get a ruling from the Ninth Circuit in the next couple of months on that one. So uh, in, in addition to uh, our litigation work, we do some other things. One of uh, them I wanted to mention was our Encrypt the Web uh, advocacy. So uh, this, is, this is both a, a technology and, and an uh, ad advocacy project. So uh, one of the things we have, the, Equip the Encrypt the Web report. Uh, so we went through and looked at uh, about 25 uh, major websites and uh, looked at what levels of encryption they were offering. Do they have uh, SSL by default? Do they have HSTS, forward secrecy, these various things. Um, and then if they did, we would give them this nice green check mark. 
Uh, so we, we published that uh, a little over a year ago, uh, and initially only a, a few companies were had a lot of check marks, but uh, uh, pretty soon a lot of them were getting into it. They said, hey, you know, we've turned this on, could you give us a check mark? Uh, and so uh, over the last year, we've had a, a, a fairly astonishing increase in the uh, uh, number of uh, these, these major service providers who are deploying uh, encryption throughout their platform. Uh, one of the ones that I'm, I'm particularly pleased about was uh, we, we gave a check mark for using Start TLS for uh, email services. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, most of the major webmail providers, uh, Yahoo Mail, Gmail, uh, Outlook, are using Start TLS, and this encrypts the communications as between the two services. So if somebody is using SSL to go to their webmail, Start TLS between the two companies and the SSL on the far end, then there's encryption along every step of the way. It's not end-to-end -end encryption, but it's along every step of the way. And that really helps protect against bulk surveillance that is trying to, uh, to look at the wires. Uh, another encryption project that I've been working on uh, recently is the Secure Messaging Scorecard. This is uh, a, a project of, of EFF and ProPublica, uh, a nonprofit news organization. Um, and we look at uh, messaging clients uh, or messaging apps and rate them on seven, I think, seven different criteria. Uh, whether they use transport layer security, whether they do end-to-end -end encryption so that the provider can't read it, uh, whether there's forward secrecy, whether their design is documented, whether their code is auditable, whether their code has been audited, um, and, and give check marks uh, for, for various programs uh, in each of those categories. Uh, it's been interesting to see how the companies have reacted to this report. Some of them have reacted quite well and actually have given us documentation and, and made public documentation, uh, which hasn't been public before. Apple was great with this. Um, some of the other companies uh, have not been so good, uh, and you can see the results uh, at eff.org slash SMS for a secure messaging scorecard. Um, I've also been working uh, with the international team, as has Kurt, on our surveillance self-defense guide. Uh, this is a sort of how-to for activists, for journalists, um, for regular people who want to start using crypto. Uh, and it's awesome, it's targeted at Mac users and at Windows users and at Linux users and mobile clients, both Android and iOS are addressed there. Uh, and it begins where every surveillance self-defense guide should begin, but so many don't, with a guide on how to threat model. Right? Are you an activist in Syria where you know, Google, is, Google services are probably fine? We help you identify that. Or are you, um, you know, someone with uh, work in the security research community with a very advanced threat model? Maybe you shouldn't be storing all of your docs uh, in, in Google, uh, Google Cloud. Uh, we help you address all of those questions. I just want to briefly mention a couple of our uh, software uh, projects. Um, we have HTTPS Everywhere, which is a browser add-on that will help uh, uh, if, if there is a site that uh, does not default SSL but uh, allows for it, then HTTPS Everywhere will make that connection uh, be secure uh, transparently in the background, and uh, we keep on adding new, more and more sites to it, so uh, it's a nice uh, a handy tool to help uh, protect you while you surf. Uh, there's also Privacy Badger. Uh, this is a, another browser add-on, and it is a tool that attempts to uh, identify algorithmically um, uh, tracking cookies and then block them uh, if they are exhibiting the behavior of a tracking cookie. Uh, so I see we have a question there. If you want to just uh, come up here and we'll, we'll hit the questions actually pretty... Just, just a moment. Yeah, just a minute. Anyone actually, if they have a question, just line up here and we'll, we'll start taking questions in, a, in, in just a moment. Uh, so, anyway, Privacy Badger uh, helps protect you against tracking cookies, and it's using uh, a model different from the whitelist or, or blacklist model uh, because of some of the difficulties that, that come from that, keeping those lists up to date, uh, and rather trying to do a behavioral model. So, uh, so check that out. And then, uh, upcoming uh, technology uh, project uh, called Let's Encrypt which is uh, designed to make it super free and easy to, uh, super easy and free, to uh, get uh, a certificate so that you can add 
uh, HCBS to your website without having some of the encumbrances that were uh, previously a challenge. Uh, that is, well, we've published some information about that. You can go check that out. At, uh, just Google for uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, and it should be rolling out in June. Yeah, it'll be super cool. You'll be able to literally type sudo aptica install Let's Encrypt. Uh, and you're in, I think it's 90 seconds or so, your Apache in, uh, instance will be configured to do SSL and you'll have a certificate that will be trusted by default in every browser um, for free, which is pretty awesome. Um, when we're talking, eh, I'll talk a little bit about patents. Uh, so neither Kurt nor I are patent lawyers. We do have patent lawyers on staff. Uh, so I don't know much about it, and if you ask me a question about patents, I'll probably say I don't know. But I do know that we have a patent-busting project uh, at EFF, and one of the patents that we're going after right now is a patent on podcasting. There's a company called Personal Audio that claims to have patented podcasting and is going around suing podcasters, or not suing, but threatening to sue and extorting money from them. So we, are, uh, we filed what's called an inter partes review in the patent office, uh, the filing fee for which is $25,000, uh, $25, um, which is the most expensive lawsuit we've ever filed. Uh, and we're waiting for a decision on that. And we, we think we made a very good case. Uh, we also have a stupid patent of the month uh, that we list every month on our website. The most recent was not actually a patent. It was a patent application. Um, Uber has patented... Or pat uh, applied to patent. Uh, applied to patent. Uh, supply and demand. <laughs> so... We, we hope that the patent office uh, will, will recognize that you cannot patent supply and demand by adding the words on a computer uh, afterwards, which is essentially what Uber did. Um, all right, question. We, yeah, let's, let's uh, take it to, to your questions. So um, let's see, how shall we do this? Well, you just sort of come up here yeah, and... Uh, line up at the podium. Why come, not? come up to the podium, yeah. This is your moment to shine. Uh, this is actually a question uh, asked by somebody on the streams. They are curious, in your opinion, what is the hardest case that the EFF has ever won? Hardest case that we've ever won? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. The NSL case at the district court level. Uh, yeah, I think we that's, haven't won that's a yet. good contender. I mean, at least we won at the, at the district court level. Uh, and this is the one I had just mentioned about national security letter powers. And as I said, there were, were about six cases uh, that, that have challenged it. Uh, and uh, it is a tough thing to challenge. Um, because uh, uh, when, when, you know, the FBI goes to the court and says, if we lose this power, you know, there, there will be... Uh, uh, you know, great national security at risk, it's asking a lot for the court to agree. And even though I think that the actual First Amendment law on whether you can indefinitely gag somebody without a judge is pretty good that you can't, uh, nevertheless, it has uh, historically been a struggle for those who have challenged it, and we're very proud to have, uh, have uh, won that, at least at the district letter level, and we need to defend it now. Um, and I'll actually, I'll give a second answer to that as well. Um, we represented uh, Andrew Arnheimer Weave on appeal uh, in his hacking case. Um, it wasn't a particularly hard case per se, but I think it's an important example of, you know, even people who are pretty terrible uh, deserve a defense, right? Weave may have done some bad things in his life, and he might be the first to admit this, but what he was convicted for was not a crime. Um, so e even though Weave is Weave, uh, we represented him. Uh, and, and I think that's as it should be. So I have a, a quick question and a, a slightly more elaborate one. The quick question is, uh, is anything being done about something like HTTPS everywhere for mobile? Because I noticed that I don't think there's any way to do that on mobile, which is, I know, where an increasing part of my browsing happens during commuting and elsewhere. Uh, yeah, Firefox on Android, I think we, we have, I think there's an HTTPS everywhere for Firefox, Android. Mm -hmm. um, Apple doesn't allow us to do that. And anything on Chrome? Um, we, it, it's on Chrome in is the browser the version, but I don't think for the mobile yet. I don't know if it is. All okay. the code is up on GitHub, so uh, GitHub, <laughs> the account is EFF.org, uh, and so you can see what code is available there. All right, and the, the slightly more elaborate one is that there was a talk the other day 
uh, yesterday about a messaging app that the team was developing that originally started out as a secure messaging app and then due to a demographic shift and some implementation issues, uh, they also were downplaying the importance of encrypting metadata of who is sending and receiving messages to and from whom. And I was curious if you could speak to the, uh, the importance of that or why that may or may not be important. Well, metadata is, is something that is important and it depends uh, though a lot on what your, uh, what your threat model is. So for example, um, for PGP is a very good uh, encryption. If one, you're, you're, you're pretty good at using PGP and that can be a challenge for some. Uh, and second, if what you really want to protect is the content of the message. So the fact that you emailed somebody and when you emailed them would not be, be concealed by that. If you want something that is also going to conceal your metadata so that someone can't do a graph, can't do uh, the, the kinds of uh, analysis that come from metadata, that is a harder challenge in secure applications, but I think uh, Pond, uh, yeah, Pond, Pond solved that. Pond is about the, only about the only product that will solve that. Um, but Pond is, please, please don't use Pond yet. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not ready. Uh, yeah. So unless, again, unless it, you're it is, the Grok and then go for it. it uh, so it, it, what, what you need will depend on your threat model and your, your ability to handle uh, some forms of tools that, you know, that are uh, perhaps not as user friendly and not as easy to use, but provide a higher level of uh, security. I mean, it, it's very important, but yeah, okay, I'll repeat the question. How, uh, in, in terms of NSA mapping out relationships, uh, that, we, that sort, sort of thing that we know is going on, um, how important is it that metadata be masked or encrypted? I, and I think it's very important, it's very difficult, and essentially no one is doing it right now. Yeah, I mean, it, certainly the, the, the NSA, I mean, in public statements, they will say things like, yeah, it's just metadata, don't worry about it. Uh, and of course, as, as probably most people in this room un understand, there's a lot that can be gleaned from, from metadata. And uh, when, you know, th this, is, this is a challenge that we have, is that metadata can be used to find out some very personal things about someone, especially if you are sitting on the wire and you're able to observe a large number of uh, uh, communications uh, over time and, and, and put analysis uh, uh, on it. Um, and right. I mean, it, uh, e even things like Wicker that, uh, and TechSecure that do some metadata masking and some encryption of metadata, the pattern analysis is still available. So back on Weave um, for a second. In the, so in our amicus brief, we spent a lot of time emphasizing consumer protective research. Mm -hmm. And when the Third Circuit threw out his uh, case because of the minor technical issue of fundamental constitutional law, we lost the opportunity to get that done in the, ninth, in the Third Circuit. Yep. Are there any cases coming up where that would be a helpful argument that EFF could be making or that other groups could be making? I'm not aware of any in the pipeline. Okay. You yeah. have like a bat signal thing like Pope Hat does to say, yeah. hey, we need, you know, some group of idiots with way too much free time to do this. <laughs> well, we try not to, to manufacture uh, cases, especially criminal law cases, because that can be really kind of tough on the, <laughs> on the person who's volunteering. Uh, but when, uh, you know, we, we actually have a lot of uh, pretty good connections with the uh, uh, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers who uh, are a lot of uh, uh, you know, good people there who, who don't uh, have the, quite the same uh, experience with the technology issues. And so when cases having to do with computer crime or, or technology issues come up, they often will reach out to us and that gives us an opportunity to find cases to make good law. I mean, other than good law about jurisdiction and venue. Yeah, and we're always looking for them. So if you happen to hear about one, um, email us, info at EFF.org. So the problem of stacking of charges that comes up in cases like Weave and Aaron Schwartz, do you see any improvement in that area or is that still just not getting any better and it's unlikely to improve because it's such a good tool for them? Um, well, it is something that, that uh, under the current set of laws, they've certainly enjoyed you doing. Just to explain to, to everybody uh, what we're talking about, uh, under the current Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, there's a number of things which are misdemeanors. 
Um, and, uh, you know, why well, you might say, well, gee that, gee, that makes sense. You know, sometimes somebody might make a mistake, but you don't want to put them away for, for many years. Um, and so uh, it's nice to have that balance out there. But uh, under the current CFAA, it says that uh, if you do it in conjunction with another crime, then it bumps up to a felony. Well, it turns out that every state has a state version of the CFAA, state law, anti-hacking statute. And so always you can find another law that you're violating, then stack it together and come up with a felony. So it turns out that in practice, they're, they've been constantly doing this, this sort of stacking thing. So a, a, an interesting part of the Obama administration's proposal they just came out with uh, uh, on Wednesday uh, is they, they, they put in a, a nod to that uh, stacking issue there, and they said in one particular uh, situation that it had to be stacked with something that wasn't solely the same uh, crime at the state level. And they used that word solely, which was kind of interesting, because it, it makes you, uh, at least brings up the question, well, what if it's like almost the same, but there's like one other little difference, you know, and it's not solely. Uh, and that is something that uh, uh, is, is um, well, has been raised, and we'll see if anything gets done with that as this, as this law moves forward. Uh, what we would like to see is that if you're going to put two crimes, you're going to do hacking in furtherance of another crime, that other crime has to be not hacking. So you're doing it in furtherance of like, you know, bank fraud. Okay, you can charge those things separately, but if you're doing it in furthering of also doing the same thing, then that bootstrapping shouldn't be allowed and we should have misdemeanors so that uh, some people who, who uh, might get caught up in the law have a chance to, to uh, you know, try to learn from their mistakes without having to spend years in jail to do it. Um, Kurt, Kurt and I actually were at the DOJ yesterday uh, in a meeting about this proposal, and we, we told them exactly that position, and they smiled and nodded. Okay, so um, I wanted to, first of all, throw in one comment about the metadata discussion, and then I'll have a different question. Sure. So there's this wonderful quote by Michael Hayden, who was the director of NSA and then yeah. CIA, that said, well, we kill people based on metadata. There's actually, I mean, this is really true. There, there are drone strikes that are done, that are called signature strikes, where it's like, this person fits a pattern of looking like he might be a bad guy, so we'll blow him up, and anybody around him and all that. Mm -hmm. So it, when, when, whenever I hear somebody say, oh, metadata doesn't matter, my first thought is, unless you're one of the people who gets killed for it, in which case it sucks. <laughs> so um, th that's, that's, a, that's the first thing. The other thing is, I wanted to know what your, what your thoughts are on warrant canaries. I've seen a lot of people trying to come up with these sort of warrant canary ideas, and they always strike me as being the equivalent of what happens when a non-technical person tries to imagine a technical solution, except applied to law, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Uh, no, I appreciate the question. So for those who, who aren't uh, familiar, the, the notion of a, of a warrant canary is that uh, you have uh, you know, a sign to the effect of, you know, we have not received any uh, national security letters. Um, and, you know, having not received one, you're not under any obligation to, uh, uh, you know, you're not under gag order yet. And then when you do receive one, well, you're under the gag order. Uh, and then it poses this sort of interesting constitutional question. Can the uh, government force you to lie? Uh, can they compel you to speak um, and say that you have still received zero when, uh, when that's not true? Or can you just remove it and say nothing, and then people will draw whatever conclusions that they draw from that? Um, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, can you uh, be honest about it, which is challenging the underlying thing? Um, and you know, so there, I think there's there's something interesting about this uh, that there is some pretty interesting case law about compelled speech. Uh, you know, it, it does happen from time to time. The government can compel you to speak. But the examples are usually in the commercial context, like the warnings on cigarette packs. Uh, and this is a message that you know, the cigarette companies don't want to be on there. But because it's commercial speech and because there's a, a, a great state interest in uh, giving people health warnings, uh, they have been compelled to speech. But in a lot of those cases, what the courts are looking at, well, is the information true? And if you could say that the warning that they wanted you to put on your product was not true, then you would be able to, to not be compelled to, you know, to, 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 to fight the compelled speech. Um, 
So it's interesting. It's untested. No one has actually had a court rule about a warrant canary in particular. If there were to be a case that were going to challenge the uh, uh, the constitutionality, you know, to 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 say that you uh, you can't be compelled to lie uh, and to uh, uh, allow this, I would like that case. Uh, well, we, we, please call us. And also, we would like that case to be one which was done in a uh, in the best possible manner. That is to say, uh, getting out ahead of it, going to the court before the time when you had to either remove or not remove your canary, uh, getting a declaratory judgment. So this is when a court you know, declares what the law is uh, before you violate it, um, and you know, brief that out, uh, and, and hopefully we can we can do something on that. Um, to you, to to the point uh, from from the question about some of them seem uh, uh, like some convoluted setups. Um, and what, one thing that I, I would say, like on the whole, if you're going to go to the court and be litigating out whether uh, you, you can have compelled speech and whether you can give an honest transparency report and so on, uh, if, if the system set up looks like it's really, really cute and that you're trying to uh, find a, uh, you know, hack the law essentially, uh, the judges are not keen on that. And if it looks like it's too cute by half, they are willing to say, you know what, uh, what you're really trying to do here is convey information that you're not supposed to be conveying, and I can see through your, your cuteness to what, what you're really trying to do. Uh, it, it's harder to hack the law than it is to hack a machine. So the, the take home here is that if you're a site operator and you want to do a warrant canary, do it something like once every six months and put it on a few month delay, because as much as Kurt and I like staying up all night to write emergency briefs, which we do, we, we like, that's fun. Um, mm -hmm. We don't like to do it very often, so please let us have time to write the brief. Hello, guys. Thanks uh, for answering all these questions. They've been really informative. Um, I want to say I fully support you guys um, and the you. foundation. Um, my question is a little bit more low-key than a lot of these top-notch questions, <laughs> which I appreciate. Um, in regards to drone video recording, what is your position on privacy and distribution of that video, and can the government access the video without permission? Are you talking personal drones with, yes. like, in the U.S.? I mean, 2015 is the year of the drone, so, I mean, we have uh, next-door neighbors, we have people in the parks, okay. businesses. Uh, our, our, our colleague, Jen Lynch... I got one for Christmas. That's, oh, that's yeah, a great sweet. question. Uh, so our, the expert in our office on drones is our colleague uh, Jennifer Lynch. Uh, she's been looking at, at, at drone issues for, for quite a while. Uh, so I mean, I'm, I'm not all that expert on, on that. Uh, Nate, do you? So um, I'll, I'll give a classic lawyer answer and just illustrate the tension here, right? There, there are ways that you can use a drone that are clearly invasive of others' privacy, and there are ways that you can use a drone that are clearly protected by the First Amendment. Like, if I'm the Associated Press and I want to, you know, film a wildfire using a drone, that's First Amendment, arguably, First Amendment protected activity. Um, so, right, our, our position right now, essentially, is that regulating the private use of drones within the United States is very difficult. Um, most of the proposals that we've seen have been mixed, um, but we, we right now are focusing more on regulating, or trying, trying to figure out proposals on how to regulate law enforcement use of drones, because um, that's, that's easier, right? Uh, to, to regulate law, law enforcement use of drones, there is a best case scenario, which is a law saying you got to get a warrant before you use a drone to do photography or surveillance. Um, very few states have such laws, and we're working hard in the states that don't. Uh, compare that to a traffic camera is the question. Uh, traffic cameras are different in a couple of ways. Uh, they, generally speaking, uh, don't actually send live video. Sometimes they do. Uh, but they are they're conspicuous, right? You know where they are. They can be mapped. Um, Epic, the uh, Electronic Privacy Information Center, which is based here in D.C., did a nice project a bunch of years ago mapping all of the traffic cameras in Washington, D.C. Um, they uh, in, DC. In, in D.C. they all send live? That's uh, good to know. Oh, that's fun. Um, but you know where they are, right? Uh, and they're not in your backyard. That's the difference. 
Uh, so by this point, I'm sure a lot of people have noticed that residential ISPs have a nasty habit of injecting things into HTTP streams. So you've got ads or there was an ISP that injected like a notification that their email servers were down into their pages. Is that legal? If so, why? And if so, are you guys seeing any avenues or making any progress in making that not legal besides, you know, just encrypting everything? Well, I mean, so yeah, you should, you should probably, uh, I mean, there, there are some self-help that one can do in that, like using a VPN and, and using, going to uh, encrypt, encrypted websites. And so part of what we're trying to do is make everybody always be going to encrypted websites so it's harder for someone to do that kind of attack. Whether it's legal, I mean, I, I, I would imagine if, if they had uh, quality in-house counsel, they wrote something in their terms of service which said that uh, by using the service, you agreed for them to be able to do that. But I mean, sometimes uh, there have been instances in when things have gotten injected without anyone's permission, which maybe you should talk about the Verizon thing a little sure. bit. Sure. Um, so it turns out that Verizon Wireless, uh, not, their, not their landline uh, ISP, but their, their wireless ISP, is injecting a unique tracking identifier in all HTTP requests uh, called UIDH. Um, you can opt out of the, the marketing term that they have for this program called Precision ID, um, but that only opts you out of Verizon selling more information about you and doesn't opt you out of the actual injection of the unique identifier. Um, I think this is pretty clearly illegal uh, under both the FCC Act and uh, the FTC Act, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, so this is an unfair and deceptive trade practice as well as Verizon spewing uh, CPNI, consumer pr pr proprietary what? network information, pr proprietary network information uh, to, to anyone or to everyone uh, that that person visits. So the answer is yes, it's sometimes illegal. Yes, it's probably sometimes legal if they've drafted their terms uh, in a nefarious manner. Um, this is why we need net neutrality, frankly. So, follow-up question on that. Uh, if ISPs are doing this, does that, do you think, uh, interfere with their common carrier protections? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. So, I mean, I, that, that's getting into what, where the, the FCC Act is, and, and uh, for, for some of them, which are FCC regulated things, they, they are of subject to that. It's actually with like Verizon Wireless, it is very clear that they're an FCC subjected uh, entity because they, they bought into a certain amount of wavelength and, and, they're, and they're doing that. For a broadband uh, provider, it's, it's a little bit different, but some of them are, are covered entities because they're also like cable companies. But anyway, the short answer is I... I'm so, sure. right. The, the ISP's argument would be that they're not a common carrier and this is why we need Title II reclassification. Okay. Thanks. All right, I think uh, last, uh, last question. All right, uh, it might be a long question, I apologize. So one thing that I haven't heard a lot about lately that I would love to hear more about is uh, this, this concept of the right to be forgotten as we've seen somewhat in Europe. And so with a predicate of um, a few things, um, such as large companies like Google maintaining copies of your data, potentially in backups that would be technically difficult to remove data from reliably, and other scenarios such as the reference implementation for PGP key servers, um, SKS, deliberately keeping not necessarily data so much as metadata uh, in terms of a large social graph of people who have met each other and signed each other's keys. What do you think, and of course the problems that we've had with personally issued or privately issued takedown notices, um, combined with the public goods that are often involved in, in having data about other people out there, um, what do you think is an appropriate domestic policy direction or recommendation or balance of these goods um, in terms of your right to not have data about you or data that you have moral rights in out on the internet for everyone to see? All right. Well, there's a lot of things uh, r wrapped up in, in that question. Uh, let me, you know, we only have, I think, uh, yes, two minutes left, so I'll see what I can do. Um, so on the right to be uh, forgotten, and, and for those who are unfamiliar, this is a, a notion that's coming out of uh, Europe that uh, a, a true facts about you can be taken down because they're embarrassing to you and you should be able to have that aspect of your history uh, forgotten. This runs up against some of the uh, free speech notions that uh, we have in the United States, which is that 
truthful speech is is protected and the government can't compel you to remove something uh, a truthful statement uh, my introduction to the right to be forgotten was uh, a while back uh, and it was uh, uh, somebody wanted a Wikipedia uh, page taken down that was about a murder that they had committed and uh, they, they had served their time and they thought well people shouldn't be able to know about how uh, I killed somebody uh, and I disagree. I thought, you know, that that, uh, that that it's very important. I understand the privacy interests, and that uh, oftentimes people will have their information um, put up, and maybe they didn't fully realize how long it would last, or or how public the audience would be, and so thus there, there's information that they would prefer to uh, uh, not be uh, on the web, uh, but. That's a, that's a challenge when it comes into to conflict with somebody who wants to uh, express that information and if it's if it's truthful. Um, so that's sort of the, the tensions at least behind that. Yeah. I mean, there. So you mentioned moral rights. That's actually not a concept in U.S. law. Um, they, it is a concept in European law, um, and you know. Th there's always going to be a tension between free speech or free expression and privacy. Th those concepts are at tension. Um, and in the U.S., we've resolved that tension differently than the Europeans have. Um, under the, the, the way that U.S. constitutional law works, we will never have a right to be forgotten in the U.S. It's just, I don't think it's consistent with the way that we've decided our norms. Um, so it's going to be interesting. There's going to be a, a European internet and a U.S. internet, and they're going to be yeah. different. Uh, okay, well, we are out of time, so thank you so much for, for coming. And uh, we, we appreciate all of your support. Uh, if you're not a member, come on down to our booth and, and become a member. We love it. Um, and if you want to continue this discussion, we're going to go to the lobby bar 